Wes Gilbert is standing at the back of the door. The doors are closed, so this is a safe place. And so I would like you to, anyone who would like to admit this morning, and be honest, who here enjoys Hallmark movies? Okay, good, thank you. You can put your hands down now. We're, we're in the same camp now, good. Uh, there's three friends, Bran and Panda and Dan, who've been friends for five years. And they're always looking for excuses to hang out. So this year, 2018, they've decided to watch all 37 Hallmark Christmas movies. Now, Bran loves Hallmark Christmas movies. Panda likes Hallmark Christmas movies, but Dan despises them. So if you want to hear their comments, go to deckthehallmark.com. For real, deckthehallmark.com. You can hear them podcast about how they interact with Hallmark movies. But you know the titles of the Hallmark movies this year? Uh, some Hallmark movies this year are Christmas in Love, Marrying Father Christmas, Falling for You, Love in Design, Season for Love, Love at Sea. I mean, do you see a theme here? I mean, come on, please, you know. I mean, Christmas movies at Hallmark are essentially love stories, aren't they? And they just happen to have Christmas in the background. Now, Major Pam and I have a theory about Hallmark movies. They always start with a woman who is a business lady, right? And she lives in the big city, and she has great aspirations for going up in the corporate world. And then she has a reason to move to the country. And you, you follow me, right? So she goes to the country because either her company's going to buy a, a farm, or she inherits a farm, or she goes somewhere in the country that's north and has snow, and there's a farm there. Now, every Hallmark movie has a drop-dead good-looking guy <laughs> at that farm, and he's usually a handyman. You know, he could be a, a wrangler, he could be the gardener, he could be the maintenance guy, but they meet. And they hate each other at first. You know, they're, they're sparks. But after time, they fall in love, right? I mean, you know this. Okay, you fall in love. And so she had, then, then there's a big Christmas event at this farm or this town. There's a big Christmas event that's supposed to take place that's in jeopardy. Because her company is either going to buy the event or buy the town or tear it down and build condos. And so she somehow becomes the savior of this event. And she keeps this event happening and becomes the savior of this movie. And then somewhere along the line, her fiancé that she has a big, big ring from, who lives in the city, who's in the corporate world, he drops in unannounced. And, and she's falling for the good-looking, drop-dead, gorgeous maintenance guy. And, and so, so then she has a, a problem. Now, always in these movies, every one of these movies has a sage, right? There's somebody there that drops words of wisdom on this lady. It could be Santa Claus. It could be a, a, a person that owns a restaurant. It could be someone old. But there's a sage in every movie that kind of helps her make her decision. And somehow she saves Christmas in this little town. And she has to decide then when her, her fiancé arrives whether she wants to, to live in the country with this good-looking guy and live there in bliss or go back to the city. But in the meantime, she gets a phone call, and she has a promotion waiting for her in the city. So she's got to decide which to take, and of course she always chooses the country, always chooses the good-looking maintenance guy, and they live happily ever after. Do you think that my wife and I watch too many Hallmark movies? <laughs> I tell you. And oh, one thing, if you notice, their coffee cups are always empty. They don't walk, and, and then there's always snow, but it's this fake soap suds snow, and you see the chunks of soap suds stuck on them, because it's probably filmed in the summertime. So anyway, we love Hallmark movies, okay? But Christmas is a time of love, isn't it? Brides Magazine says that 19% of all engagements take place in December. The most popular day to pop the question is Christmas Eve. This next most popular day is Christmas Day. Then there's New Year's Day. And then, of course, there's Valentine's Day. But Christmas is a story of love, isn't it? It's a story, it's, it's a love story, it's the greatest love story ever, ever involved that involves you and involves me. Because God is love. And the love story began at the moment of creation. God's love was with our first parents before they sinned 
and after they sinned. God's love was with Noah and his family, saving them from the flood to give them a new start. God's love was in the Old Testament because out of his love for his people, God gave them the law so they could stay connected to him. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that three, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And then God turned the world upside down by putting on skin and being born in a barn to become one of us. To work hard, to get calloused hands, to feel the joy and the pain that you and me as humans feel. Now, this love that God showed us is not this gushy feeling that we may get in our stomachs when we first fall in love. That may be indigestion. <laughs> but love is demonstrated in action. The most familiar verse that we know out of a, a Bible version called the Voice Bible goes like this. For God expressed his love for the world in this way. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not face everlasting destruction, but will have everlasting life. Here's the point. God didn't send his son into the world to judge it. Instead, he's here to rescue a world headed towards certain destruction. At Christmas time, we talk about gifts. A gift is for the purpose of being given. If we purchase something for ourselves, it's probably not a gift. Now, in our family, we're real practical. We'll buy our own Christmas gifts sometimes, give it to the, our partner, and have them wrap it and put it under the tree because we know what we want. But most people, gift is something you get for someone else. And God's gift to us at Christmas was his son. It's very significant, I believe, that the Bible talks about God giving his son. Isaiah 9, 6, we read it last week. We read it a lot this season. For unto us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God loves us so much that he gave. The night before Christ was executed, he told his closest friends, he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus loved us so much that he gave. In Romans 5, 5, it tells us that hope, as we talked about last week, does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. God loves us so much that he gave. But a gift is useless if it's not unwrapped, if it's not received and so this verse in John chapter 3, verse 16, has, has two gifts. The first gift in that verse is unconditional. It applies to everybody. The second part of that verse has conditions. The first part says, For God expressed his love for the world in this way. He gave his only son. There's no conditions to that love. There's nothing we need to do to require to receive that love because he loved you and me and the world, the people in the world so much, he gave his son. You and I don't have to do anything to receive the love of God. God gifts, God's gift of love is for every person on this earth. If you happen to look at the night sky and conclude, like the late Stephen Hawking did, that God is superfluous, that he's not needed for the universe to exist, God's love is for you. If you've known him in the past, but you've made the conscious decision to turn your back on him and exclude him from every area of your life, God's love is for you. If you have caused unspeakable heartache to family or betrayed the trust they have in you, God's love is for you. If you have shaken your fist at God and said, where were you when I needed you? God's love is for you. And, because of, and out of this love, he gives us a choice. So the second part of John 3, 16 talks about a condition. Because he loves us so much that he's given us freedom to believe in him or freedom to choose not to believe in him. He gave, we receive, and the gift we open 
is an everlasting life of love with him. So if we choose to believe, it shouldn't stop there. We should not hoard this gift of love, as Major Miller mentioned earlier, because we need to re-gift that love, don't we? I once got a birthday card. This is the truth. True story. I got a birthday card from a friend, and the card, the card had nothing written on it, but it had a, a, like a, a note card inside, and, and her message was on the note card. And on the note card, she said, when you finish reading this, send the card back to me because I wanted it to send it to somebody else. And that's the truth. I did. And, and someone else got that same card um, because she didn't put her name in it, and, and she loved that. She re-gifted that card to someone else. And as I was working on these thoughts, okay, I was, I was sitting at home and, and working, putting this together. As I was studying the scriptures about love, an email came through while I was studying the scriptures on love. And it was from one of my classmates in Japan as a child. I knew him from the second grade on. He's a missionary in Japan right now. And he sent a note to our classmates with this illustration. Story about Eric Little. You may remember him from the movie Chariots of Fire years ago. He was an Olympic gold medalist from Scotland. And he was a missionary in China during World War II when the Japanese occupied China. He had worked in a place called the London Missionary Society Hospital. Now this was a time when Japanese and communists both hated Christians and were killing Christians for their faith. And Japanese soldiers, the enemy, were brought into this hospital and the medical staff would not treat them because they were the enemy. They were here to kill people. But when Eric Little arrived, he gave help to anyone who needed it, no matter what side they were on politically. And he was asked by these, chap these Chinese people there, how can you help Japanese soldiers when they were killing so many Chinese people? His answer was this. I see every human being as someone who God loves. Eric Little was re-gifting God's love. And, and that re-gifting spread so much around that hospital that soon Chinese and Japanese, enemy, friends, everyone found medical help at that place because of his re-gifting love. Not long ago, Major Pam received a, a Facebook message from her niece who explained something about her 10-year-old son. This is what she said. The, the niece wrote, he explained to me that they have a new kid in class with autism. He says, he's my friend. He's not different. He's just special in his own way, like everyone else is special in their own way. Words of a 10-year-old. He fits right in, and everyone treats him just like he's part of the group. So her niece writes, I asked him if anyone's bullied him. This 10-year-old boy said, no, but I told my teacher that if it happens, I will be his friend and stick up for him. A 10-year-old boy who's re-gifting the love that's given to him and re-gifting it to a young boy who needs that. This morning, our challenge is, are we re-gifting that love to someone else? We're never too old. We're never too young. We don't have to be Bible scholars. We don't need a college degree. All we need is to receive the gift of God's love which he provides for us. And once we receive that gift, then you and I can re-gift that gift. This morning, who do you know who could use the re-gift of God's love this holy season? Where, where do you see the spark of God's love in your life? Who, who today needs a touch of kindness and encouragement through you or through me? Who needs us to re-gift that love to them? We're going to sing our chorus, Oh, come, let us adore him. As we do, I would invite you to just look at the front of the source here because there's questions on the very front here. We see that. And some of these questions we mentioned, what darkness might you be facing where do you see the spark of God's love in your life? What, who today needs a touch of kindness? And since love lights the way, how can all our Christmas celebrations be driven to be expressions of love? Who can we re-gift God's gift to us to this morning? Let's think of those thoughts as we sing on our chorus, Oh, come let us adore him. Christ the Lord, of course, you may come kneel here if you feel you can adore him better here. If you can adore him in your seats, that's perfectly fine. You know the words. Close your eyes. 
bow your heads. Let's adore him for these next few moments as we worship him and receive the gift of love that he has given to us. offering this gift. He's giving it to us free. All we need to do is accept it. And then once we do, let's re-gift it. Someone pray for these gentlemen here praying. Sing the chorus again.
love for us is beyond our wildest imagination. God, we thank you for caring for us, for putting skin on and, and knowing what it's like to be one of us. And as we go through this season of Advent, the season of remembering that first Christmas, but also looking forward to your return again, may we continue to receive your love and to re-gift it to those around us. Thank you for your blessings and for your Holy Spirit being here today. For it's in your holy and your precious name we pray. Amen.